When you think of doing business in Russia, unfortunately, the word corruption comes to mind. In fact, some statistics suggest that costs associated with corruption can add 20 percent to the cost of doing business in that country. Well, INSEAD affiliate professor of entrepreneurship Stanislav Shekhnia has just published a white paper on doing business in Russia. He joins me now to discuss these so-called informal practices and anti-corruption policies. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. In your paper, you survey the CEOs of companies that are doing business in Russia with regard to how they use these so-called informal practices. First of all, why are you calling them informal practices as opposed to corruption? Does that mean a shift in, in the whole scene? I am a leadership uh, professor and a leadership researcher. But as you said, the theme of corruption is so important in Russia that when you study leaders, you face the issue of corruption uh, all the time. So. I decided that it's time to try to understand what is corruption in Russian business. And uh, it turned out that there are not that many studies uh, that really paint the picture, real picture of corruption in Russian. We talked to the CEOs of the companies initially and we, uh, we asked them what are the things which would be considered corrupt and that destroy their enterprise value. And we came up with a, tw with a list of 27 practices, and then we surveyed a large group of CEOs trying to identify what are the frequencies of occur occurrence of those practices in their businesses. And uh, uh, what came out of this study is that uh, such practices as bribe extortion by the government officials, uh, bribe extortion by the representatives of administrative and supervisory bodies like fine inspectors uh, are still on top of the list of the um, practices that destroy value of the Russian companies. But we also found that businesses suffer a lot from so-called internal corruption. We did not concentrate on explaining why corruption is there. What we were interested to, to see how companies are uh, preventing corruption, what anti-corruption strategies they are applying, and is it possible for a standalone business uh, to effectively prevent corruption in such corrupt environment? And is it? It's impossible to fight corruption as the whole. It's like trying to prevent winter from coming. Companies that prevent corruption effectively do not fight corruption as such. They identify specific practices which represent the major risks for this specific business. They identify specific practices which, which they want to target. They set very specific goals in, in, those, uh, in those areas. They make it a CEO business. The CEO really leads the, uh, leads the, um, the campaign against the corruption. Actually, campaign is not the right word. Uh, it's not a campaign. It's a, it's a s continuous struggle. It's part of the business. Uh, and when, when they do it this way, then uh, they achieve very, very impressive results. Give me an idea of how you would manage corruption. I'll give you an example of one of the company that participated in our, uh, in our study. And I have to say this is a company with a very long and not so straightforward history of doing, doing business in Russia. This is a company that at the early stages of its development used informal contacts, informal ties, to get some short-term competitive advantage. But the company became really big, important, and leaders of this company realized that if they want to preserve value, uh, they need to start fighting corruption. And they turned the page. It was not very easy for them to turn the page because in the past they used things which we would consider corrupt. To get, uh, to get things done. But here they said, now it's time to do things differently. And what, what they did, again, they identified specific risks which they considered the most important for their business. For example, again, one of such risks was the kickbacks from vendors. Uh, another was the conflict of interest of some of the executives. They set very clear goals of zero, zero tolerance in, in those areas. They developed very comprehensive rules of conduct for different levels of employees in the organization. They trained people in those rules. They communicated very openly 
they created a number of tools like hotlines, conflict commissions, uh, conflict resolution uh, schemes for the organization, and they moved on to get rid of people who did not live according to the new rules. But it sounds as though they've taken it in bite-sized chunks. Absolutely. They, they addressed very specific concerns. They did not say, okay, we want to become a corrupt-free organization. Well, in three vague. years. <laughs> no. They said, we want to become kickbacks free organization in three years. And we want to eradicate the conflict of interest of our executives in three years. And that's what they're doing. And they've made a lot of progress in this area. And it shows in the, in the bottom line as well, they report that they improved, they reduced their cost per unit of the final product, but 15% after applying this anti corruption strategies. Do you think a day will come when um, the corruption will be minimal in, in Russia? And do you think that might come quickly with globalization, as you've said? No, I don't think it will come quickly. Uh, again, I would not speak on the macro level, but on the micro level, I see it's a long way even for the CEOs of the company and owners of the company to fully realize that they could and should prevent corruption from happening at their company. So I think it's a long way, but uh, corruption really takes a significant chunk of value created in Russia. And as global competition intensifies, businesses will have to deal with this because they simply will not be competitive uh, with companies from other countries. Stanislav Shekshnia, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you, Shannon.